You're listening to Consulting Logistics, presented by Aborn and Company. I'm your host, Tim Dooner. Thank you for joining us today. All right, let's get this started. I have company in the studio today. It's a returning guest, Aborn and Company's own Director of Operations, the one and only Chris Peckham. Welcome to the studio, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. It's good to be back. It is good to be back. Last time you were here, we talked about shipper of choice, right? That's correct. But you also had a kid. So how is the baby doing? Callan is doing very good. He just passed the uh, seventh month mark. He's got some teeth that are uh, breaking through. He's crawling all over the place, just under 20 pounds. All in all, he's doing great. So if you start nodding off during this, I'll, I'll understand <laughs> why. There's nothing like a teething baby at home. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I mentioned shipper of choice. That's really coming back into the forefront. So go over to consultinglogistics.io. Tune into episode six. That's when we talked about shipper of choice. But today, we're going to mail it in because we're talking about parcel shipping. And Chris, I'm glad to have you here. Because, well, I've done a lot of work in this industry. I've, I've worked on nearly every side. I've done ocean. I've done air. I've done LTL and FTL. I've never actually personally dealt with parcel. So it's going to be an honor to learn something new with you today. All right. Sounds good. So let's, let's get started at the beginning. Just in general, what do we even mean when we say parcel shipping? Yeah, a parcel shipment to me would be any package up to 150 pounds. Once you exceed that 150-pound threshold, uh, then you're subject to some pretty severe penalties with UPS and FedEx, uh, more of which we'll get into a little bit later on. So that's like mail, right? You order something from Amazon, a single package going to a residence or... I mean, how does it differ exactly, though, from freight? What's the separation there? Yeah, the separation is that it could be an individual package, right? So if we think about UPS, uh, they offer their normal package delivery services, which would be anything from, say, one-pound package up to 150 pounds. And then they also have a partner program with the Postal Service, which they call SurePost. And that's when you get into some of your more ounce-based weights that are being delivered to a consumer. Okay, well, that all sounds pretty simple. So why are we talking about parcel shipping in 2019, though? What do shippers need to know about parcel shipping throughout the year? The big takeaway from this year is that, one, both FedEx and UPS did a very good job during the holiday season, during their peak, in managing their flow of freight. If we go back a year and we think about the 2017 holiday season, things were pretty bad in terms of overall performance. So for 2017, FedEx actually performed better than UPS with a 97.6 on-time delivery rate. That went up slightly year on year. UPS was the big loser from 2017 with around a 95% on-time rate. That improved to 98.5%. The reason why FedEx managed it much better in 17 is that they were holding their customers accountable for forecasting. And any significant deviation from that forecasting, they just weren't going to guarantee the service. Now, both companies definitely invested in their own networks. And based on the performance of this past holiday season, that investment has definitely paid off. So what kind of challenges do shippers face this year in this market, though? What, what has changed, especially at the end of 2018? I know there had been a lot of talk about challenges on the postal side. I know there was strikes up in Canada. There was the e-packet ruling with Trump. Does this even factor into what we've seen with like the LTL market and the freight market? Is there any crossover or overlap? There is a bit. I mean, holistically, transportation costs are still going up. And we see that loud and clear from the GRIs that were released by FedEx and UPS. Now, both companies announced a 4.9% GRI, that's general rate increase, for 2019. UPS, they announced this on 12.7 and they actually implemented it on 12.26. So that left a little bit of a bad taste in some of the shippers' mouths. It's not a lot of time to work with IT to get all this costing updated. It's not a long time to have all your systems fully integrated. And for anything that would impact an end customer, it's not a lot of time to reach out to those folks and, and assess the impact of that. However, across the board, 4.9%. But as we know, it's not a blanket 4.9%. So if I'm a logistics manager, I can't just say, hey, finance for 2019, we're going to take our small package costs and we're going to layer in 5%. That's just not the way that it works. What we saw uh, with these GRIs is that both UPS and FedEx are starting to target the heavier express shipments. In years past, they would typically go after the lighter weight shipments, and that 4.9% would be higher in those weight bands. For this year, we see the complete opposite. They really went after the express business, and they went after the weight breaks of 50 pounds and above. Could you give us an example of that? Yeah, absolutely. Let's look at a FedEx example here. So, three-pound package, home delivery, going to zone three. 
2018, and again, this is before any discounts that being applied that you would typically have in a contract, the package cost would be $9.48. When you factor in your residential surcharges of $3.60, the other home delivery charges, you're looking at a total package cost of $16.53 before fuel. 2019, that total package cost is now $17.34. That's an exact 4.9% increase. Now, if we look at a standard overnight package, 63 pounds moving to zone 5, previously that package was $373.79, an additional handling fee of $12, so your total cost of $385.79 before fuel. In 2019, that same package is now $420.93, or a 9.1% increase. So here's a clear example of how they're targeting the express business in the higher weight bands. Now, when shippers approach parcel carriers, is that similar to how they approach an LTL carrier or a shipping carrier? How exactly are these rates even determined? So they're determined by UPS and FedEx, and in some cases, there's room for negotiation. One of the areas that you really want to focus on if you're a shipper is going to be your accessorials, your surcharges. So on average, and some shippers do an excellent job of managing their accessorials and surcharges, some shippers don't work with their carriers to get discounts applied on their surcharges. So on average, shippers could pay anywhere from 20 to 35% of their total shipping costs in the small package world are attributed to accessorials. So it's important to have very granular data to really understand where you're shipping to, your package characteristics, overall, what percentage of your total spend is attributed to accessorials, what are those key surcharges and accessorials that you're getting hit with, and really focus in on that. So if we know this year that the express business is getting increases anywhere from the 7 to 9% range, where your lighter ground commercial shipments are in the 4 to 5% range, if I'm an express shipper, I know that those are very targeted areas that I need to work with my carriers on to try to mitigate some of these increases. When you mention accessorials, what exactly is an accessorial on a parcel? Sure. So there are some similarities between the accessorials and the surcharges, specifically when you're talking about freight dimensions. So if you look at, say, UPS, what they did with their large package surcharge, and a large package surcharge would be any package that weighs less than 150 pounds, is greater than 108 inches in length, and greater than 130 inches in girth. And girth is length plus two times your weight plus two times the height of the package. Again, can be a little bit confusing if you're not familiar with this. So both FedEx and UPS apply the same standards. They have different costs that get applied to these packages. So if this package qualifies for an oversize or a large package surcharge, UPS last year was charging $90 for that package. In 2019, that's going up 22%, and that's going to cost you $110. FedEx charged $80 in 2018, and in 2019, it's going up 12.5% to $90. Still very substantial, and if you don't have a good understanding of your package characteristics, and this is not a negotiated surcharge, you could be paying through the nose on this stuff. What about stuff that can really make or break a business, especially a retailer? Things like out of area or residential deliveries, or you're talking about holiday deliveries or Saturday deliveries. We see Amazon all the time. They've changed the game, right? I don't know. Is there a day they don't deliver anymore? When, when you're negotiating this stuff, how mindful do you have to be of the needs of your shipments to make sure you're outlaying that stuff ahead of time to really know what you're going to be paying? Absolutely. So any of the residential surcharges, your delivery area surcharges, those are both going up to the tune of 5 to 6%. And I think you said it very well. You really need to understand the service level itself and the actual need for that. I can't tell you how many times we look at customer shipment data and we see priority overnight services. Now, a lot of companies don't even, they don't even have a negotiated discount on priority overnight when standard overnight would really do. We also see customers who are shipping things two-day Air Express when a ground service would meet the same service commitment. Now, if you have a great relationship with your carrier, they should be catching this and reapplying the ground uh, pricing versus the two-day Air, but they're not obligated to do that. So it's really having a good understanding of the service levels and your actual needs. Yeah, I remember back in the day working for another company that would send out shipments. And all we would do is go to a scale, 
and it would print out a FedEx label, and it would always be the same service level unless there was some note on there. And it was it was always two day, but I'm sure there was probably a lot of lost money in that. Is that kind of what you're talking about here? That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And the move to dimensional pricing as well has changed the game. And we're going to see LTL uh, in the coming years follow suit. So now, previously, everything would be rated on your actual weight. And now it, everything's being rated on the greater of the two, your dimensional weight or your actual weight. So each shipper will have a dim factor in their contracts. Now, interestingly enough, both FedEx and UPS two years ago would just give a standard dim factor to any shipper of 166. They both reduced that to 139. Now, that's a negotiable point. Uh, so what you really need to understand there, again, going back to data, is what percentages of my packages are dimming out versus weighing out. That's going to drive the conversation with UPS and FedEx on what that dim factor should be. And like I said, there is room for negotiation there, but going back to the earlier point where it seems that UPS and FedEx are now attacking the higher weight shipments, what that tells me is that negotiating dim factor and dim relief may be more difficult going forward than it had been in the past. Man, these are all familiar terms from my time with Ocean Freight. GRIs from the carriers, service levels, but it also sounds like another best practice from Ocean Freight carries through even to parcel, which is that you really should consider both cost and time. Is there a blind spot there, though, where shippers are only really thinking about weight and dimension? Uh, there could be. Uh, there absolutely could be. As we mentioned before, we typically see express service being selected when a ground service would suffice. And a lot of that comes down to who's manning the store, so to speak. So you may have somebody that's working in a shipping office that isn't familiar with overall service levels. They're selecting whatever came down from corporate saying, this needs to be here by then, please ship this overnight. When in fact, a ground service would have covered that. And talking about parcel, and one of the reasons I wanted to learn more and thought this would be a great show is because e-commerce now accounts for more than 50% of total retail sales. In 2017, consumers spent $453.46 billion on the internet for retail purchases. That was a 16% increase compared to the $391 billion spent in 2016. We don't have the info from the U.S. Commerce Department yet on 2018, but all trends seem to, to show that it's going up, right? That is a lot of packages. So what kind of effect is e-com having on all of this? It's having a significant effect. So before we mentioned about operating costs going up, uh, in operating costs, you know, there's going to be fuel. Uh, that, that's definitely a consideration. So if we just look at the on-highway diesel pricing over the past couple of years, you know, in January of 2017, it was around $2.58. January 2018, it was $3.02. So about a 17% year-on-year increase. And just today, the EIA posted rate was $3.01. So essentially flat to January of 2018. So operating costs are definitely being impacted here. UPS and FedEx are investing significantly in these super hubs, right? So these super hubs are coming from their own investment. It's their own dollars that are being poured in here. So when they release these GRIs and they talk about operating expenses, these are the things that they're referencing. However, it's interesting to note that the projected inflation rate for 2019 is only 2.4%. So the GRIs essentially double what inflation looks like. So you can look at it as kind of a money grab too from that perspective. But operating costs are going up significantly, no question about it. You know, it seems like, I don't know, in the mid-2000s, up until I think, and I think you can look at when the laws were changed on how taxing works. So Amazon used to be able to buy tax-free from there, right? And the second they changed that, Amazon started putting hubs everywhere they could. They really proliferated throughout the United States. Are other shippers sort of taking on that, that mentality where it's better to have a hub system instead of having one giant you know, warehouse or distribution center in a centralized location? Absolutely. I mean, it's been a game changer. So everybody now is, is trying to position themselves, and maybe not everybody, but a significant amount of shippers are trying to position themselves on, let's make sure that we're in a position where we can hit every piece of the population within two business days. Now, in some cases, there are some locations more towards the middle of the country where you can hit 80, 85% of the U.S. The lower 48 within two shipping days. But for all intents and purposes, people are positioning their DCs around population density and where they see their orders flowing through. Let's talk about some of the risks involved. Last November, postal strike, big postal worker strike in Canada. It could have been catastrophic. It was a three-week long strike. Their government eventually ended it. There was a backlog of 4 million packages. They claim they eventually got all out, but that's got to send shippers' anxiety through the roof. What is the risk factor involved with shipping parcel in the United States, in Canada, or in other countries? Is it something to watch out for, these strikes? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially on the UPS side. So there were threats of the airline mechanic workers union going out on strike right before holiday season. It didn't end up happening, but something like that could be absolutely crippling. And because it's a duopoly, because you only have one other provider that you can work with, your options are pretty limited. And at that point, say you, there was a strike with UPS, you can't just move all your freight over to FedEx and expect them to cover that from a service standpoint. So there'll be a residual effect of late shipments, completely missed shipments, lost revenue. I mean, it, the outcomes could be catastrophic. Yeah, and I can't imagine during the holidays, it, I don't see consumers being all that forgiving about a strike. And it's really not your fault, right? You just can't, you can't get your freight back. You mentioned this dual, duopoly. So, and I love that word. Thank you. Can I even say it? Duo, duopoly? <laughs> Duop, duopoly. Yeah. <laughs> Am I saying that right, Chris? Yeah. Duopoly. Duopoly. You mentioned this duopoly. There's only really two carriers to, to, to go against. So how does a shipper even save money in an environment like that when you're playing these two? Or you just go who's ever best in the region? How does that work? It's difficult. I mean, the typical strategy has been to pit one against the other. The problem is, is that both carriers are going to be pretty ingrained with a sophisticated shipper from an IT standpoint. So it's not exactly something that you can unplug and then plug in the other one. It's not really a plug and play model. It takes time to transition. You also need to be very wary in your contracts on what the what your termination clauses look like. Uh, in some cases in the past, both carriers have charged a fee for early termination. So you want to make sure that you're doing your diligence on the contract side to make sure that you're covered legally if you were to shift all your business away from one provider to the other. Now, even if you just took a portion of your business away from one and gave it to the other, the residual effect is that your pricing is going to be impacted because both providers work on a tiered incentive-based structure. Meaning, if you're hitting X amount of dollars in a 52-week rolling average, your discounts will be Y. If you hit Z levels, then your discounts will be et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so by taking that revenue away from one and giving it to the other, uh, your discounts are going to decrease with your current provider. So the real savings opportunity, it sounds like then, is looking at service levels and looking at the time frame in which you're shipping it and, and the packaging that even your products come in and maybe be even smarter in the design factor there because you can't really pressure the carriers against each other. So you got to look, you got to look a little bit more inside, right? You got to go a little bit further than the negotiation table. Absolutely. I think internal controls is a great place to start because you'd be amazed once you start to dig on how much money was just sort of thrown out the window there when a lower level of service would have completely sufficed. So if you have a good understanding of that, and again, we go back to the data and your package characteristics, then when it comes time to negotiate, you can just be laser focused on exactly where you need to focus your negotiation strategy. If you are shipping a lot of product, say in that one to 10 pound weight range, and we know that both UPS and FedEx had around a 4% increase there, you don't even need to talk about that. Where you would want to focus now is that residual express on the heavier weight band side, where we know that they had that seven to 9% increases. So again, it's just coming down to having a good granular understanding of your own freight. Chris, I have some bad news for you. I saw the following headline on Bloomberg, and it says, Trump's trade war is going to kill off $1 yoga pants. What are we going to do now, Chris? <laughs> so what are they talking about there? What was this postal treaty? Because that's what they're referring to, this postal treaty going on eBay and buying $1 yoga pants. A postal treaty went through last year for, I think, e-packets. And it's supposedly it's going to maybe change the game. I don't know. Tell me what you know about it. Sure. So this all ties back to the UPU or the Universal Postal Union. This actually dates back to 1874 and was an output as a result of the Treaty of Bern. It became a specialized agency within the UN in 1948, and in 1969, the UPU introduced a new system of payment where fees were payable between countries according to the difference in total weight of the mail between them. And this is what's referred to as, quote, terminal dues. So when the president started to talk about terminal dues, this is exactly what he's referring to. The boom in e-commerce has really changed the game here, especially from the Far East. So for an example, any package weighing less than like 4.4 pounds, they're paying an extremely low terminal due rate. And these terminal dues aren't even covering the actual delivery costs of the delivery itself in the destination countries like the U.S. For example, you could ship a package from Virginia to North Carolina at a cost of $1.94. 
you could ship that same package with the same characteristics from Shanghai to North Carolina at a cost of $1.12. And to further complicate things, the Chinese government, for example, will be subsidizing a lot of these sellers and shippers in China. So they're able to really offer these rock bottom prices and the terminal dues that are being paid, again, aren't covering the operational costs. So the USPS is operating at a net loss when it comes to any of these packages moving from the Far East. So this $170 million subsidy, and I think we've all seen the results of it. If you're a shopper on eBay, you've seen these really cheap products, and sometimes it looks a little too good to be true. What is some of the purpose of changing these e-com things? I know it's going to level the playing field for U.S. shippers, but is it going to help us in, in any other way? I mean, with counterfeit goods, I know that's a big problem. Drugs could be bad. Yeah, that's exactly it. So at the end of the day, it's definitely going to help any of the domestic manufacturers, right? It's certainly going to help Amazon sellers and eBay sellers. It's going to reduce the amount of knockoff and counterfeit products, as you had already mentioned. However, the other residual effect is that if you're a U.S. consumer and you're still going to be purchasing from these China Far East based origins, uh, you're going to pay more in shipping due to these terminal dues. So the president has announced that the U.S. is going to withdraw from the UPU unless they can renegotiate those terminal fees to a more respectable or a more net positive level. I have gotten duped by those before, like on Amazon. If you don't ship Prime sometimes, you'll, you'll order a thing and then you'll check the shipping date. It'll be like 16 to 20 days later. And then it comes, it's, it's from China in one of these e-packets. And they usually smell a little weird when you open them too. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So all this, they're changing, they're changing this e-packet rule. We talked about some of the, the, the regulations that are coming through, but which way do you see these rates trending? What's the outlook for UPS and, and for FedEx with their rates in 2019? Yeah, I, I see the rates going up. What's going to be interesting is to see what happens again during uh, this coming holiday season. So, you know, in this past holiday season, FedEx made the decision not to increase residential surcharges, right? And that's very applicable to what we're talking about because a lot of that's going to be driven by e-commerce, things that are being bought online. FedEx decided not to, to increase those resi surcharges. UPS, on the other hand, decided to increase them over 7% for the holiday season. So they not only gave you the GRI for 2019, but they gave you a peak season surcharge as well on anything shipping residential. So overall, I see costs continuing to go up. You know, they've already announced the 4.9% for both of those carriers in the small package network. In the LTL space, we're seeing anywhere from 3 to 7 to 8%, depending on the shipper and depending on the volume as well. Truckload, we feel like the market's going to temper itself a bit. We're definitely expecting single-digit increases in costs. But again, it'll be lane-specific, um, and it'll be, it could be tied to commodity as well. But overall, transportation costs are certainly going up. Peak season surcharge, the PSS, also the bane of the ocean world. I guess it, it, it goes right into the parcel world as well, right? Whenever you can charge someone more, why not? Are there any other charges associated with this that shippers should be mindful of? Yeah, I think one thing to keep into consideration is understand in your contract what's going to go into your freight calculation. So previously, things like additional handling, things like large package surcharge were not being calculated as a freight charge. That's not the case anymore. So those are being rolled up into your overall freight number. That's going to be impacted as well. So definitely something to keep an eye on in your contracts. Sum it all up for us then. What are, what's some advice and what are some best practices that shippers can do if they're going to talk to their UPS representative or their FedEx representative in the near future? The best thing that you can do is have a very granular understanding of your data and your shipping patterns. So if you can go to your rep with very specific and targeted areas that you want to see improvement, the general consensus is they're going to be willing to engage in those conversations. But this blanket 4.9%, unfortunately, just gets absorbed with a lot of shippers, and they don't really understand the overall impact. So the data here will certainly set you free. If you have very good data, you have a very strong understanding of your shipping patterns, you should be in a much better position to negotiate these points with your UPS or FedEx rep. Or you can do what the place I worked for did and just rate everything the same exact way and just put it on the scale and send it two day, right? There you go. <laughs> it makes it easier. That's probably going to cost you a lot more, though. <laughs> Looking to modernize, digitize, and future-proof your supply chain? Visit dayone.io for a free day one data optimization report. That's day, the number zero, the number one, dot I-O. Isn't it time you got optimized?
Announcing, on October 10th, 2019, Aborn and Co. presents TransTech 2020, a supply chain vision and innovation conference. This event is the first of its kind in Boston. Join our panel of speakers from the worlds of logistics and technology as we discuss the modern needs of the supply chain and the merger between the physical and digital footprint that freight creates. Head on over to transtech2020.com for more details. We'll be talking about AI, automation, autonomous vehicles, blockchain, data purity and capture, future-proofing the supply chain, market conditions, transportation management systems, and so much more. Head on over to transtech2020.com for registrant and sponsor details. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, feel free to email me at tduner at abornandco.com. That's T-D-O-O-N-E-R at abornandco.com. I'd be happy to learn something new with you. For this episode and all of our previous shows, visit consultinglogistics.io or simply search for Consulting Logistics on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player of choice. And hey, if you like the show, the best way you can give back is to share it. And if you really liked it, go on iTunes over there and rate and review. Be much appreciated. Well, Chris, thank you for the for your time. I think we can put a stamp on this and, and throw it in the mailbox. Uh, is, is there really anything else to say about parcel shipping or is it is it kind of that simple, but there are those really important, crucial things to be mindful of? No, I think that's it. I think if you can focus in on those few points that we've tried to talk about here today, I think you'll put yourself in a much better position to go into negotiation with your carriers. Perfect, man. Well, that's it. We're out of time. For Chris Peckham, I'm Tim Dooner saying take care and happy shipping.